Okay, in this section, 4-4 uh, four, four in the textbook, we're going to cover concavity and the second derivative test. And the main points of this section are to determine intervals on which a function is concave up or concave down, find any points of inflection of the graph of the function, and apply the second derivative test to find relative extrema of a function. Now, a point of inflection is where a graph changes from concave up to concave down or concave down to concave up. And let's you know uh, talk about the last couple sections. In earlier sections, we were finding uh, critical numbers of our function. So we would take the derivative, set it equal to 0, and we might find a couple critical numbers where we knew we had a horizontal tangent line. And we, you know, uh, we might have had a graph that looked something like this. We knew that when we plugged our, or we set our derivative equal to zero, we found uh, some points, which we called critical numbers, and those told us where we might be able to find mins and maxes of the graph. So we took our derivative, we found x1 was a critical number, and we knew that was a zero sloped derivative there, a horizontal tangent line. And we also did the first derivative test, where we would look at intervals that these critical numbers chopped our graph up into. And we would you know, test a point somewhere in that interval, plug it into the derivative, and know that on this stretch our function was increasing. And then between the critical numbers, we picked out a point, a test value, and we found our function was decreasing. And you know what we're doing here is identifying uh, interesting features of this graph. Where are we going up? Where are we going down? Where do we have these, you know, absolute max or relative max, absolute mins and relative mins? Another interesting feature of a graph, if we want to make a pretty detailed sketch of it, would be these points of inflection. And those determine where our concavity changes from up to down. Sort of in this graph that I've drawn here, you know, our first derivative was set to zero to find these horizontal tangent lines. What we're going to do in this section is take our second derivative. You know, we had our f of x f prime of x gave us our critical numbers. And those helped us find our mins and our maxes, our extrema. When we take the second derivative, f double prime, and set that equal to 0, we're going to find these points of inflection. And graphically, where those points occur are going to be in between these mins and maxes. When we set our second derivative equal to 0, we might find a, a point of inflection maybe right here. Point of inflection, I'll abbreviate. And we know on one side of this point of inflection, it looks like our graph here is concave downward. And on the other side of that point of inflection, our graph changes to concave upward. And remember, this is our second derivative. Our first derivative is an instantaneous rate of change, a rate of change. When we take a second derivative, that is the rate of change of our rate of change. How is our rate of change changing? We could have a function that is increasing at an increasing rate, or we could have a, incre or a function that is increasing at a decreasing rate. And what I mean by that is, you know, our function is increasing, we're going up. And as we're going up, our, this function would be increasing at a decreasing rate. As I'm going up, I'm going up at a, a less and less for each uh, jump I make on the x-axis. So we are increasing, but you can see that we are, it looks like we're going to eventually level off. We're increasing at a decreasing rate. And that tells us that we are going to be concave down over that interval. Uh, and on the other hand, if we were increasing at an increasing rate, maybe our function's taken off like this, we are going up, but we're going up at a steeper and steeper angle each time, increasing at an increasing rate. Eventually, we might hit a spot where our tangent line would be uh, vertical here, and then we might switch to increasing at a decreasing rate. Now we're going up, but not up as steep. This would be our point of inflection when we make that transition from increasing at an increasing rate to increasing at a decreasing rate. So we've, you've already seen that locating the intervals in which a function f increases or decreases helps to describe its graph. In this section, you'll see how locating the intervals on which the derivative increases or decreases can be used to determine where the graph is curving upward or curving down. And here in the blue box is our definition of concavity. Let f be a differentiable function on an open interval i 
the graph of f is concave up on the interval if the derivative is increasing on that interval and it's concave down on the interval if the derivative is decreasing on that interval. It sounds simple enough. Uh, the following graphical representation uh, of concavity is useful. So one, let f be a differentiable you know, let f be differentiable on an open interval i. If the graph of f is concave up, then the graph lies above all the tangent lines. So if we come down here to the graph on the left, we have this curve, and we pick a few points here, and we draw some tangent lines. And we can see that all the tangent lines are under the graph. So that tells us the graph is concave up, or the derivative is increasing. Number two, let f be differentiable on the open interval i. If the graph of f is concave down, then the graph lies below all the tangent lines. So here in the graph all the right, we have another curve, and we have a few points where we have found tangent lines. Uh, each of those tangent lines is above the graph. The graph lies below the tangent lines, so we are concave down, or the derivative is decreasing. Okay, to find the open intervals on which a, the graph of a function is concave up or down, we need to find the intervals on which the derivative f prime is increasing or decreasing. For instance, the graph of f of x is one third x to the third minus x. Oops. So our function is concave down on the open interval from negative infinity to zero because the derivative is decreasing. And here if we look at the uh, the picture, we're looking at the integral interval from negative infinity to zero. It says the graph is concave down. And if we look at the derivative graph right underneath it, we see the derivative is decreasing. It's going down, and our graph above it is concave down. Uh, also, the graph of f is concave up on the interval from zero to infinity because the derivative is decreasing. So here again is our parent function. We're going from zero to infinity, and it says we're concave up. We can see the graph curving up here. And if we look at the graph of the derivative right beneath it, we see the derivative is increasing. So when the derivative increases, we have a upward concavity. When the derivative is decreasing, we have a downward concavity. And here's our theorem, uh, our test for concavity. Let f be a function whose second derivative exists on the open interval i. If the second derivative is greater than zero, or if the second derivative is positive, for all x values in that interval, the graph f is concave up on the interval. If the second derivative is less than zero, if it's negative, for all x's in that interval, then the graph of the function is concave down. To apply this theorem, we locate the x values for which the second derivative is equal to zero, or for which the second derivative does not exist. Then second, we use these x values to determine our test intervals. Finally, we test the sign of the second derivative in each of those intervals. And then we do have this little note down here. It says a third case of this theorem, you know, we have positive and negative. What if they're equal to zero? Our third case is the second derivative is exactly equal to zero for all x's on the interval. Then the function is linear. And note that concavity is not defined for a straight line. In other words, a straight line is neither concave up nor concave down. OK, so let's take a look, take a look here at example one. And it says determining concavity determine the open intervals on which the graph of this function is concave up or concave down. So we're going to want to first take our second derivative. Let me slide this up so I have a little more room. Our function is f of x, and that is e to the exponent of negative one-half x squared. So when we take our first derivative, f prime of x, the derivative of e to the u is e to the u du. So we're going to have our e to the same power, 
1 half x squared, negative. And then we, by the chain rule, tack on the derivative of this upper function. And the derivative of this upper function is just going to be negative x. So there's our first derivative. Now when we find the second derivative, we're going to have to apply the product rule, because now we have two terms. We have this term is our first, and this is our second. So the product rule says we want to start out with the first function times the derivative of the second. So here is our first function. That does not change. First times the derivative of the second. And the derivative of the second function would be negative 1. So I can just put a negative sign out front here. So first times the derivative of the second plus the second function, negative x, times the derivative of the first, this e raised to that power. And that derivative we sort of already found when we found our first derivative is e to that exponent times negative x. And let's clean this up a little bit and combine some stuff together. So when I look at both of these terms here, well, here we got a negative x times a negative x. That's going to be a positive x squared. And I'll still have my e term. And over here, that's not going to change. Negative e to our exponent, negative 1 half x squared. And now I look, I see I have two terms. And I can factor something out. Each term contains this e raised to the power. So if I factor that out, I'm going to have outside e to the negative 1 half x squared power. And then inside some parentheses, what's left? Well, I factored this all out, but there's still a negative 1 in there. We have our negative sign and our e term, so a negative 1. And in the second term, we factored out the e term, so we're left with a plus x squared. And to make that look a little prettier inside those parentheses, I'm going to reverse those terms around so my negative uh, term is not first. So here, remember, this is our second derivative, f double prime x is equal to our e to the negative 1 half x squared. And then in the parentheses, we're going to have x squared minus 1, x squared minus 1. And for this second derivative test, we want to set this second derivative equal to 0. And we have two terms. When will this first term ever equal 0? It's e raised to some power. It's not going to equal 0. So the first term we do not have to worry about. But let's check out the second term. x squared minus 1 equals 0 when x squared minus 1 equals 0. And we could factor this down into x plus 1, x minus 1. Or we could have just moved the negative 1 to the other side. It'd be x squared equals 1. And the roots of that would be plus or minus 1. So x equals 1 and x equals negative 1 are the two numbers that we found here that are going to chop up our uh, test intervals. So we now know our, let me write this up here, our test intervals are going to be chopped up at 1 and negative 1. And we're looking at the whole real number line here. Oops. Back that up. Uh, so let's see, we start at negative infinity. And we go all the way to negative 1. And then we go from negative 1 to positive 1 and then from positive 1 to infinity. And now we're going to pick a test value from each of those intervals, plug it into our second derivative, and come up with our conclusion based on just if it's positive or negative. So let's see here in our first interval, a good test value would be negative 2. When we plug negative 2 into the second derivative, we get a positive output. So the sign comes out to be a positive output. And that tells us that we are concave up. Concave up. In our second interval, from negative 1 to 1, a great test value to use is 0. If we plug a 0 into the second derivative for x, we get a negative output. 
and that tells us that we are concave down. Con down. And our last interval goes from 1 to infinity. We can pick any number we want in there. Let's just keep it simple and pick a positive 2. If we plug that into our second derivative, we get a positive output. And that again tells us that we are concave up. Now let's take a peek at the graph that goes with this function. Uh, there we go. And we'll bring that to the front. So the first thing we did is take our second derivative, set the second derivative equal to 0, and that told us our interesting points here were at 1 and negative 1. And that chopped up our intervals. So here in the first interval, from negative 1 to infinity, we plugged in a test value here at negative or 2. We found out that that gave us a positive value, so we are concave up on that interval. And then that interval stopped, and the next one started, from negative 1 to 1. And we picked out a test interval, we, or we picked out 0 for our test. We plugged 0 into the second derivative, and we got a negative output. And that told us we were concave down across that interval. And finally, for the last one, we plugged in 2. We got a positive output, and that told us that our graph was concave up across that interval. So down here it says, from the sign of the second derivative, you can determine the concavity of the graph.